How do I define life? Sometimes the desperate longing for peace, and other times the sudden rush of adrenaline. I'm really clueless of what exactly is the pace of my life. Dozing off for hours and hours as though it helps me run away from reality. I am a rebel. I'm angry and frustrated. I'm looking for freedom and I find my pill in partying hard, drinking down my agony. But then there was this endless void in me that something wasn't right. I'm trying to come out of it. I'm trying and I'm miserably failing. And I know that the clutches of that life has kept me bound. And I know I'm losing it. And that is when I met him. Hi, my name is Ashita Dimando and I come from a Catholic family, born and brought up, raised in Bangalore most of my life. I was in the finance sector for quite a bit in the IT industry, but now I finally uh, found my calling, which is teaching. I'm involved a little bit with the prison ministry. I teach those children, I spend time with them, just giving them life skills and just the love that they need. I'm also involved with youth and uh, children's ministry and a part of a prayer group called Couples for Christ. My childhood, what I remember, I was quite a naughty and rebellious child. Uh, from what I know, my mother would say this and I would do the opposite. Maybe it was just my, um, you know, willfulness, my me wanting to be so uh, independent of anybody having to tell me anything, I would do right the opposite. So I was constantly, you know, nagged or said I was naughty or I was disobedient, I was this and that. Even at home, even at school, I would be the same. I was extremely naughty. I would probably not even study, not do my homework. I was basically not interested to even go to school. So as a rebellious kid, I kept getting into trouble and those, those were little things that, you know, you get nagged for and people start speaking down on you or, you know, your self-esteem is so low that you yourself don't value yourself as a person. And I was probably sad at times. I would think of all these things as to what life is, but then again, I would go back into, you know, doing whatever I wanted to do. So basically, a lack of love from all sides just, just kept pushing me away and I just, you know, realized that, okay, you know, I, nobody cares about me. Why should I be bothered about what they think? They anyway tag me as bad. I might as well do the things that are bad that, you know, they think that I am. So from my childhood, what I remember of God and, you know, just the faith is what I would say is uh, it was zero. There was the name God, but there was no connection. There was no face that I could relate with. Of course, prayers and things were a part of our family. We were forced, we were forced to stand, we were forced to kneel, we were forced to say prayers and it just became a very monotonous experience. I would always question myself, what is the standing, sitting, kneeling, you know, singing, then you, somebody reads. It was just a monotonous Sunday experience, which I never paid attention to. Our parents were away for most of my life. We were, you know, not in the same city, not brought up in the same uh, town. And so I had the freedom to do what I wanted. So I chose to sleep over going for mass. And as I grew up, I grew a little away. When I had my first Holy Communion, and then there was no church. I just stopped going to church because I loved sleep. I got into college. Now, college is a place where everyone says, oh, have fun, it's the best part of your life. It's like you're a free bird. Such a lovely place, such a lovely place, such a lovely place. And I got into college and, you know, I just started hanging around with, uh, you just get drawn to, you know, rejects or rebellious people. Any time of fear, any time of fear, you can find it here. 
my morning would start not by going to my college for the first hour. Every first hour I would be absent because I would be sleeping and then I would have late attendance and then I would be like, okay, anyway, the lecturers are going to scream and yell at me. I might as well go to the pub. So I would, you know, gather my friends and we would all end up in these pubs in Bangalore. So we would go there and start our drinking sessions and then we would just be drinking. We would not attend classes. And slowly I remember getting deeper and deeper into the party lifestyle and uh, smoking was something, uh, you know, I just got, got drawn to. Smoking would just give me that freedom, like I said, you know, it would just feel like queen of this world. I own my life, I can do whatever. It just gives you that sense of freedom and pride. You and I. I got into like deep, heavy metal and rock uh, music. You know, just got into these um, activities, it became a routine. It was not like a oh, social drinker or smoker, no. It was, it just became a habit, it became an addiction. So I would do this at every day. Just go here, drink, go. It became like pub hopping. Like you go from one pub, you drink there, then you go to another pub, like shopping, try different drinks. The idea of college became that you're a free bird, do what you want, go to any extent, nobody cares. Just go ahead and enjoy, enjoy life to the brim. When, you know, you're hanging around with friends and things and you just get deeper and deeper and then it just becomes a lifestyle. But at the end of the day, though we would drink every day, go back home, you would feel empty again. And I would wake up again, do the same thing again. Though that temporarily you were satisfied, there was some emptiness that I felt. There was something that was in me that said, this is not right, this can't be life. How can life be so monotonous? Where is that essence of something? There has to be more to life than this. These questions kept eating me at a very early age. You know, your parents are away, so you just start staying over at friends' place, and then one thing leads to another, and then before you know it, you're living a life of sin. You know, I always believe that you've already taken one step. What is keeping you from taking the other step? So you just go deeper and then you know you're in deep waters and you're literally trying to swim out. You're drowning. You want to, you know, leave this lifestyle. You want to quit. You're trying, you're trying. You're not just coming out of it. But then I knew inside I was dying. I knew I was not finding that purpose, that value, that fulfillment from all these activities. Though I was into it, I was still empty, I was still sad, I was still probably depressed. I, you know, I don't know what I was going through inside, but it was dark. It was dark. And uh, one day, one of the stayovers and party drink and you know, whatever. But there was this friend of mine, he was very different from us. I mean, we would hang around, we would do, you know, things. He would be very, he would be present, but he, his lifestyle was very different. I would always look up to him for some reason. I don't know why. But then he was present that day and still remember this scene. It was a couch and I was sitting down. I was like very sad. Literally, when I say hit rock bottom, it was like a hopeless, gone, you lost, you're just gone situation for me. And I was sad and I was sitting and, you know, I, just thinking of what I had done. And then this friend comes to me and he says, you know, I know that, you know, you've done these things and you feel bad, but there is someone who loves you and who has already forgiven you. I was like, who loves me and who's this? Why does he have to forgive me? He's like, do you know why Jesus hangs on the cross? I'm like, who is Jesus? I couldn't even see or know that there is someone called God who you can put a face to. He said, Jesus died for your sins, these very sins that you committed. That is exactly why. It was something I'd never heard before that the summer. That there's someone who loves you even though you, you know, the only thing you've done is wrong. And, you know, ever since childhood, you've just been told how wrong you are or how bad you are. And then 
people only love you because you're good. But here is, he's telling me that here is a God who loves you because you've, you know, all these things that you've done doesn't matter to him. And this is exactly why he died. That moment when he told me Jesus loves you, those words and he forgives you. And from that down phase, I remember just, you know, looking at him at you know, this friend of mine and, you know, just gazing at him and what he was saying, it was like a brand new love story that he was reciting to me. And that weight that was lifted off just changed my whole outlook because I, I felt freed. The most important thing is that I am wanted by somebody, I am loved by somebody, I am accepted regardless of what I do. I am not loved because I am good but I am or bad but I am loved because there is a God who made me, who created me and He loves me just as I am even now. He, he told me, oh, do you have a Bible? I said, yeah, there is a book I've seen. Never read it, never even opened it. It was collecting dust. And when I went to take hold of it, I felt something pulling me. But I said, I just grabbed it. And, you know, he asked me to open John 3.16. Little that I knew, I was like, what is this? God so loved the world for, you know, oh, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So all I had to do is believe that God loves me, believe that God died for me. And I would have life. There was nothing that I had to even feel sorry for, but not feel like, you know, I'm, I, I'm doomed because Jesus is there to save me. I started spending time uh, in the chapel and then I saw that there were other, you know, students there from my own class. I'm like, wow, these people know who Jesus is. And they started telling me, though they were Protestants, a few Catholics, uh, I never knew what praying was. And then over there, I'm sitting, holding hands and we are praying and saying, you know, praying for the others who don't know, uh, you know, that God exists. For me, God that didn't exist, the name God that I couldn't pay, put a face to was suddenly, you know, he appeared. You know, when I opened the Bible and I started reading this, every question that I had in my life about life, it was like the answer was there in this book. And my only question was, where on earth was this book all along? I was so blinded by the world and the things and the normality of life that I there was no room for me to even look at that book. This book gives you so much perspective as to why, how you came into this world, that God brought you into this world, that there is a purpose to your life, that there is meaning to your life, that you are needed, you are very, very, very important and there is just one. There is no hundred Ashrita, there is one Ashrita who God has a specific plan for that He has to accomplish. If I can't do this, no other person can accomplish. And the more I started exploring God, I started going for something called retreats. And I didn't know what these gifts and vision, nothing, I blank. I didn't even know what adoration meant because I had not gone to church and here I was sitting and they said oh we're gonna have adoration now I'm like what is happening and then everyone kneels and I'm still sitting I'm like why is everyone kneeling why is everyone bowing down what is happening and I was so sad that I didn't know what to do I just sat there I was just sitting like this the monstrance was raised and then the person um, who was leading the worship said Jesus is walking and the next minute I knew I was on the floor kneeling down raising my hands and my tongue was I was like what is happening and all I knew was I was saying hallelujah and I was not in control and I was just you know crying <laughs> I still remember it was like a river a flood Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. That's what for me it is at that moment when God walks, you can't stand, you have to kneel and...
I had experienced this um, new life, I would say for two, three, two or three years, I started going regularly for prayer meetings. But then I think there was still this inclination towards my old lifestyle. I would still um, get tempted, I would say, go to my cigarettes or to have a drink or, you know, just go party. So I was like, Oof, you know, it's so difficult. It was just so difficult to give up. So I would go to the prayer meeting and in the evenings, I would take the Bible and go to the pubs. Just so that, you know, uh, to console myself, I think I don't know what I was trying to do. Then I, there was this thing saying, what am I doing? I'm being a hypocrite. On one side, you're putting this face that you're very, God has touched me. You are trying to live that life. But on the other side, you're still living a very, um, you know, what is the difference? How do I even make out what is holy? I'm not holy because I'm still living that lifestyle. I'm trying to deceive somebody. I just wanted God when I needed him and what I want to do, I will still do. But then something started eating me from within saying, what am I doing? Here was somebody who I encountered, who loved me. No conditions were given for his love. I experienced his love. I dwelt in his house. I experienced the joy. And again, I am going for the pig's food. Again, I was wallowing like a pig in that mud, in that dirt, in that filth. And again, empty. You know, one of the things um, that we think these short-lived satisfaction, it's going to you know, make us feel great. But what we are actually doing is paving our paths to our own destruction. I just made up my mind in 2009-ish. I said, enough. This is enough. I've tried you and I've tried this again. And I know you are like a million times, million times more gratifying, more satisfying than these small little temporary uh, you, gratifications. I want you back in my life. I want to come back to you. Make a way for me. I do not want to return to this old life of mine. I do not want to return. And from there on, God opened a door for a retreat and you know, healing came and I attended a three-month course. I just said, I'm done with it. I quit my job. I said, I want my holy life. I want to know what God means. What is holiness? After three months, I don't know what happened. I came out, I was literally delivered. I felt something coming out of me. I don't know what it was, but I just felt as if something left me. That is when I knew how powerful demonic forces are. I'm seeing the power, you know, that just sitting and praying, the peace, the joy. I felt fulfilled as a person. I started feeling, okay, God has call me for a purpose and I have to live that and it was So I started evangelizing more, I started reaching out to people more and then I saw that my calling was, you know, to be with children and to teach them. So I took that up as my career as, as well as my calling. I'm also involved with the um, uh, prison ministry. I spend, you know, time with those children, teach them here and there and life skills. Just, just be around, uh, you know, these kids who are deprived of a lot of love from home and just give them that purpose. They're not alone, that they don't have to feel uh, rejected and dejected. Wrestle in my expectation. I'm married now, I'm married to Mithun John Augustine. It's been three years since we've been married. I know that we are all seeking this thing called love and attention but in that search to be loved to feel loved to feel accepted we do sidetrack we take the wrong route but the truth is that only the true love that you find in God can truly fulfill or fill that void that you're carrying in your heart you can fill that that emptiness that you've been struggling with, the questions that you've been struggling with, the addictions that you've been struggling with, there's only one person that can just wipe away, make it vanish from your life is Jesus. But that little prayer that I made 
or that friend who came and told me those words opened my eyes and changed my life for good and that is what i wish for each one of you that that you seek after the real pearl the real gold the real treasure you will find peace joy and happiness the truth will set you free My life is a miracle. Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story.